This time featuring Big Joe Klein, my guy. Joe, I wear the old uniform in honor of you. Looking nice. What's yeah. up? Mine. <laughs> this used to be baggy. There's no doubt about it. You got mine on. It's a it's an undershirt now, though. <laughs> <laughs> Back in those days, it was, I was just looking at it, how baggy oh, yeah. the shorts were and, and the shirt. So the fact that it, it, I can still barely fit into it, I don't think actually is uh, is that big of a deal. So how's it going now? Currently, you're calling games, SEC Network. Yeah, I've got a few uh, things. Really enjoy it. And you got corkies. Yeah. Corkies. Got how long have you had corkies now? 1996. We're going on our 25th year. Wow. What's the go-to? Your go-to at Corky's? Well, I mean, it's a barbecue joint. We, we have a real diverse menu, but the dry ribs are outstanding. But if you want, we have wraps. We have a thing called the ultimate uh, chicken wrap. And it's, it's, and then we also have a queso wrap. It's smoked uh, chicken with cheese sauce you got me drooling now how come i've always wanted to have a, a a rib eating contest with you and you've never ever taken me up on the offer the only thing is you gotta you gotta provide the rib right, right. <laughs> it doesn't have to say I know how this works with you okay so you, you're not talking to some schmuck who doesn't know you i bring 10 racks of ribs you eat one and say you're full and that that i win and you take home seven and a half racks of ribs. Or, you, or or you sell them to your boys up there in, in, in Gloucester or, or a Peabody. Everett. Or I got Everett. them, boys, I got them hot right out of, right out of the stove. How many you want? Uh, so I want to start in, in Slater, Mo. Slater, Missouri. Obviously, uh, you, you, did you grow up, what, big family? Did you have a big family? On? Three brothers. Three okay. brothers. Yep. So it was all, it was rough and tumble. Basically, oh, yeah. rough and tumble That's business right. out there. <laughs> and it, my poor mom, God bless her. I mean, it was, it was a, it was a, it was like WWE. Right. Day, you know. How was your high school recruitment? You first, you started at Notre Dame, right? You went a year there, and then over to Arkansas. Was that yeah. a whirlwind? Was that? Yeah, I mean, back then it was different, Pat. I mean, they would send you letters, so like. After my, I made all state. I was six eight, made all state after my sophomore year. So you know, you start getting questionnaires and getting right. letters. You know, it's so different now. But they would send all these letters to the school. So my coach would, I'd be heading home, and he'd hand me a stack of letters. Well, I'd go home, and you know, I had a chest in my basement, and I'd just throw them in there. And this went on for eight months to a year. And then you know, starting my junior year, you know, my dad was kind of like. Uh, you know, are you getting any letters or anything? He said, yeah, man, you know, I got some letters. He goes, well, where are they? I said, oh, they're downstairs in my, in my chest. And, you know, there's 300 letters. In there. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, you know, my dad being an accountant and being a organized oh. freak, you know, he, lo he lost his mind. You haven't responded to these people? Yeah, yeah right, right. Like, you know, 16 years old, you know, no, we're in my boat too, you know. <laughs> so, uh, we got that going and then, but you couldn't really, and then and then going into my senior year, I, I finally played, I never played AAU ball until going into my senior year. I remember a guy from Kansas City came down and my coach grabbed me and said, an AAU guy wanted to see you after school. And Pat, I swear to God, the only time I'd ever heard of AAU back then was track and field. Right. And, right. and I mean, I was like, why the you know, hell does an AAU, track and field guy want to talk to me you know my coach is like looking at me definitely like, not for the high jump or the long <laughs> jump or... sprint sprint none so i mean i was and he was like you know no you idiot you know he's with a basketball program so I, and then and then i got out on the circuit playing and then then that's really you know after people kind of saw me because slater was hard to get to and right. really missouri was recruiting me hard uh but they were the only ones because I went to their basketball camp in the summer. So they were really the only ones. And so, but once I started playing some AAU, it kind of picked up from there. Went, went pretty crazy. What, what was it about coach Sutton, coach Eddie Sutton, who I can just, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that seemed to be, and you'd be successful anyway, there's no doubt, but 
the things that you, when you got to the Razorback program, it just seemed the success, like the guys that you played with, playing for Coach Eddie Sutton, Hall of Famer, um, how, what kind of an impact did that have? I mean, was it, could it be something where you could say is it changed your, your path in life? Oh, no doubt. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, because, I mean, I, I loved Notre Dame. I, I really liked it, but I did not enjoy the basketball up there. And, and it, they had a different way of doing things. When I got to Arkansas, there was a lot more structure. I needed that uh, from a, from a. Were you a hellion? You a hellraiser? No, I was talking about, they did more, they did more like, uh, I mean, we didn't have a weight coach at Notre Dame. We didn't we didn't lift weights. If you lifted them, you were on your own. Right. There wasn't a lot of preseason stuff. They just wanted you to play and concentrate on your studies, which is which is great. But there was no, we're gonna run at the track at you know Cleveland Hill. There was none of that. You know there right. was you know October fifteenth started and you know we started practicing and I I needed more than that. I needed. And at Arkansas, that certainly had a lot more than that. So I think that's where it helped me primarily the most. And then I worked harder than I did at Notre Dame. I was more dedicated to basketball. So it wasn't all, you know, Notre Dame. It, I mean, I had a lot to do with it too. But I just think Coach Sutton, you know, brought that out into me. And, he, and his staff brought that out in me. And the players that you were surrounded with, you know, all bought into we're going to work. Right. You know, they didn't work. The coaches really didn't need to get on them. The players got on them, and you you know better than anybody when you when you have that that that's culture. That's great. Right. That's what great uh, teams have. I'm sure recently you've been able to think about Coach Sutton and the impact. And you guys had a, a pretty diverse team too. You had not only you from Slater Mo, you had guys from Chicago, uh, Daryl Walker, and and a few few other guys. What what was it about? Alvin Robertson wasn't a bad player. <laughs> yeah, Alvin Robinson. Where was he from? Barberton, he... Ohio. Ohio, okay. Yeah, Barberton. I think it's I think it's Toledo area. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure though. Uh it so what was it about Coach Sutton that he was able to get all those guys on the same page and be as tough, from what I understand, tough as nails, but also right. You know, there wasn't guys leaving. They wanted to play for him. Right. There, was no there was transferring in, not well, out. Well, I think it's a lot like Nolan. I think you saw fairness. I mean, he was fair. I mean, he didn't, you know, he didn't treat me any different. When I was redshirted and not playing, I got treated and was held accountable and was coached the same way as Scott Hastings was. And, mm. and, and those guys, and Daryl Walker and Alvin and, and so I think you see a fairness there, and you and I think you see a uh, consistency. There's the things were consistent. You know, it wasn't up down. I mean, it was like you're going to do this, you're going to do that. If you don't, there's consequences, and if you keep having consequences, then you're going to be looking for somewhere else to go. And so, <laughs> you know, you, you figured it out, and yeah, so yeah. guys figured it out. But again, it was fair. You you were if you played. And you could play, and you could help us win. You were playing, and so that that was that was. I think that's what made it so easy for him to be hard because he was he was also very fair and very, I don't want to say loving, but he was a good guy. I mean, right. he was, he cared about you. He talked to you about other stuff than basketball. Uh, he got involved with your life and things like that. And so I think I think that was the 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 really the cherry on top is that. You know, he, he'd push the hell out of you, but then he would, you know, he would, it wasn't always basketball with him. And I think that's why he got really connected with his players. You had, you part of one of the, the great <laughs> wins of all time when you guys beat number one, North Carolina at Pine Bluff. What was that? Was it, that was 80, was that four? 84. Yep. Okay. 83, 84 season. And uh, uh, yes. Yep. Where were you guys? So were you guys in Dallas that day and came yeah, in? We had a we played three games in four days, and they were the third game. We had we was had the Southwest Conference schedule back then. Well, it was Thursday, Saturday. Okay, and, and they added North Carolina on Sunday. It's the only day they could make it work, and it was for national TV. It was for NBC, and Got so it. 
uh, that was the day it had to be. And so we were trying to chase Phi Sigma Jamma. They had beaten us early in the year in Houston and they were undefeated in conference and we had one loss. It was theirs and, and this was going into February. And so we had to go to A&M and then to SMU Thursday, Saturday, and we had to win those games. I mean, those, those were, we weren't even talking about North Carolina. We didn't, North Carolina wasn't even on the map because we, you know, we were trying we're to catch on those. Yeah. We were trying to catch Houston and we, we won, we won both those games and we were going to leave Saturday. Uh, we played SMU Saturday afternoon and we were going to hop on a, a plane, a charter and fly to Pine Bluff or fly to Little Rock and then play, play uh, North Carolina at, I think noon the next day. Well, there was a tornado come through uh, Arkansas. And so instead of Coach Sutton, instead of us sitting there waiting and waiting in the airport, he finally just said, look, we're going back. We'll leave in the morning because nobody knew when we were going to be able to get out. So right. he wanted us to get a good night's sleep. So we got up on Sunday morning. We watched 30 minutes of North Carolina tape on Saturday night. We got up and got dressed and taped and went over the scouting report at the Anatole hotel in dallas oh great hotel yeah we had our we had our uniforms and warm-ups on taped walking through the lobby <laughs> got, up, got on the bus got on the plane and flew to north carolina landed probably 9 30 10 o'clock had a bumpy ride coming in and then rolled up in the bus put our bags in the locker room went out and got in the layup line and beat beat the number one undefeated <laughs> team in the country <laughs> So that tells you right there, coaching's overrated, Pat. <laughs> sometimes, though, Big Joe, sometimes, you know, when there's too much time to think, oh. maybe if you had too much time oh, to think God. about Michael Jordan and Parker. Brent Doherty, <laughs> yeah. we'd have had a week to prepare. We'd have, <laughs> we'd have walked in there scared as yes. could be. <laughs> Yep. They had, uh, you know, obviously Charles Ballantyne hit a, hit a great shot to win that game at the buzzer. So, one of the amazing things, and I always tell you how charmed of a career you had. And that, I mean, that doesn't take away from your oh, hard work. You're right. <laughs> because, but because you put in the work and you would have been as successful no matter what, it's just sometimes other things happen. Uh, in the 84 Olympic team, you played a 1984 Olympic team. The roster off the charts, Steve Alford, Patrick Ewing, uh, Chris Mullen, Perkins, Alvin Robinson, Wayman Tisdale. Mm. In the I still, I still don't know how I made that team. <laughs> Serious, I don't. I don't. I still to this day when I I don't know how the hell I made that team. Is I mean, it? I, I mean, I worked hard and. What were the tryouts? How many tryouts? So you get invited to? We flew in. They invited seventy-two players. And wow. We flew into Bloomington. Well, we flew into Indianapolis, bus to Bloomington, and then we were there like a week. And and Bobby Nice, the head coach, obviously. We, so we that adds another element. We practiced in this field house that had tartan rubber track surface. Oh, that, I remember those. And there was like six courts that they kind of taped off. And, and then there was a big tower in the middle. And Bobby Knight would sit up in the tower and watch. And you would, you would in the morning, you would kind of, they would, you would go through a little bit of uh, kind of a, a little bit of a practice kind of, I think it was kind of the stuff that coach Knight wanted to do and implement and kind of see who could catch on and, you know, shell drills, stuff like that. But then, you know, a lot of it, you just, you know, and then you'd have coaches, you'd be on a team and then those coaches were kind of instructed, you know, you, you, they would try to teach you how to run the passing game because he wanted to run motion and, mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And, and so, you know, luckily, you know, that's what I, that's what I came from, you know, coach. Right, right, right. I mean, I was, I was doing everything that they were running for the past three years. And so I think that had a great help for me, but, and then we just started balling and you would ball, you know, four or five games a day and you'd be out there balling and there'd be all kinds of NBA scouts and every college coach in the country was there. And they'd be just, it'd be like being out at the park and people right. standing on the sideline watching a pickup game go full court, you know, just only it was, you'd look out there and it'd be Chris Mullen and John Stockton and Vern Fleming and 
Raymond Tizell, Charles Barkley, Carl Malone. So it was it was crazy. So, so what's 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 now mm -hmm. the story is you guys scrimmage the NBA and I'll say in NBA All Star team because it wasn't like the East West. It was like the best of the best. What uh, was that just set up as? Hey, we need some extra work. And you guys were in LA at the time, right? Well, was we, we played eight exhibition games, all against NBA teams. And so around various parts of the country, we would travel and they, I know we did Phoenix. I know we did uh, Iowa City because uh, uh -huh. Coach Raveling was a coach on the team. Uh, you know, I can't remember all the places we went, but we, we went and played these teams, these eight NBA teams, Indianapolis. We played in the Hoosier Dome in front of about 65,000 people. Uh, and so we would play these guys and, you know, and, and we, we never lost to them. And so that was kind of a big deal that we beat them. But, it, you know, what was funny, Pat, is four years later, you know, I played against the 88 Olympic team. They called me up and said, hey, can you come – in Oklahoma City and play them. And I was like, yeah, and I, you know, I fly in the day of the game, you know, and so, and then these guys are practicing and running right. plays and doing stuff. And so that's the way it was with us too. I mean, you know, Larry Bird. They were just playing. They were playing pickup. You guys were preparing. They're, they're in the middle of their break, you know, right, right, in the right, summer right, break. Right. So, I mean, you know, we, we never lost to them, but I tell you, I think in Milwaukee towards the end when we hadn't lost, there were, it started getting, real physical because, you know, the NBA players were like, you know, so they started playing like 80s NBA, you know, right, right, yeah. Jordan and us would go to the hole and stuff and we would get the freaking bejesus knocked out. <laughs> I mean, there was some, there was some tension and there was some, right. I imagine, you know, because they, they didn't want us to beat them every time. So it was what pretty was, when you, well, you played against Jordan in 84, obviously, uh, when you guys beat them when he was at North Carolina. But then you got that period with the Olympic team, practicing with them. What, what was it, the first things that stood out about him? And could you tell that he was – could you tell he was going to become what he is today oh. back in 84? Anybody who tells you that's lying, okay? <laughs> now, everybody knew he was going to be an NBA All-Star. I mean, everybody right. knew he was going to be – but nobody – saw that coming i mean nobody saw that coming and so and if they tell you that they're they're full of it nobody, <laughs> but i mean they everybody knew that you know he he was going to be a, a what boy. then what was what was the the spark that or the, the the things that he had in him do you do you think that helped propel him to oh he's competitive uh, just it, it's, it's, oh just yeah. every day in practice you know just when you scrimmage, I mean, he wanted to win. If, if he lost, I mean, just his competitive nature was off the chart. I mean, we were all super competitive. Right. He, he was. He never you know, took you per diem on some card games, did he? I stayed far away from that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not the, the smartest person in the room. Hey. But I can look over and see what's being thrown on the bed. And if I don't see George Washington, if I see <laughs> Andrew Jackson's and uh, – Grant's going out there on the bed. I go to the next room. I'm, hey. kind of, I'm kind of a George Washington. And when I really <laughs> feeling frisky, I'll throw a Abe Lincoln out there. On there. <laughs> hey, your accountant, uh, your accountant father taught you well. That's for sure. Was that, when did you meet your wife, Dana? What's what she's, is she Missouri girl? She's sitting right over here. Dana, what's up, Dana? Hey, well, she is, she's kept you in line. God bless her. Well, I mean, she would wait for me after every basketball game. <laughs> yeah. She would follow me around. And, you know, so finally, after every game, I'd walk out and she'd be like. No. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, no one believes him, Dana. <laughs> Blind date. My, my partner, really? Corky's, his wife, Carla, and Dana were uh, roommates. Okay. So I knew Carla before I knew Dana. And I, I was, I was like. Carla, hook a brother up, man. Help, <laughs> help a brother out, man. <laughs> Direction. I'm, I'm so lonely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get Coach Sutton anymore. I don't get Coach Knight anymore. I need to. <laughs> um, so, all right, 84 happens. You guys win. You get first year in the uh, NBA. You get drafted. 
uh, by the Kings, Sacramento Kings. Who, who, who was your first mentor that you can, that, or, or even one or two guys that really made an impact your rookie season early on that showed you the ropes? Um, I really uh, remember Eddie Johnson. Yeah. Mike, Mike Woodson. I mean, those were, those were really, you know, really good guys that I really liked and really uh, looked up to uh, just hardworking guys. And, you know, they were really, uh, you know, they helped me. They talked to me and, you know, they would, uh, they're just good dudes. I mean, they were really good dudes. Any rookie hazing? Oh, yeah. oh. Barry, back- carry the bags, oh. bring the donuts. You know what my name was? You know what they called me? I mean, I'm guessing not Big Joe. <laughs> no, JR. I mean, we would be in the huddle and the coach would say, JR, you're in. Joe Rook. <laughs> Joe Rook. I mean, I, I got called. Might have been Jelly Roll or something like that. You had well, a- Joe Rook. I mean, I was like, I would be in the game and the and coach would be like, JR, come here. Right. And they never let you forget you were a rookie. Yeah, and I was just like, I mean, it was like, it was a, it was a damnedest thing. It was like, you know, it was like, okay, I thought this was going to kind of go away after a month or so. <laughs> it, it stuck. So it was, it was pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, was it 15 years in, yeah. in the league? Yeah. yeah. Now, a lot of people may or may not know, I'm not going to have you list all the teams that you did play for, just the you teams have- you didn't play for, because that's a lot less. <laughs> 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 we, we don't uh, no, seriously so you uh you get you you go play for the Celtics right yeah. you, trade happens you're pumped what year was your first year with 89 it was 89 okay it was the 88 89 season 88 89 uh so now I don't know if you so it's 1990 1990 okay I'm I'm a, I'm a young whippersnapper eighth grade this is my mother cut this out of the local newspaper. Can you see it? Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. It was some shooting contest. Wow. Okay. So years later, it's in it's in the attic collecting dust. I go, what the heck is this? So I look on the back of it. It's oh. Joe Klein. Oh, nice cardigan. nice cardigan there, baby. <laughs> Playing for the Celtics. <laughs> Presenting an award to the 1990 Tewksbury freshman softball team. <laughs> what a man of the people! I got I got all the big big gigs. <laughs> I tell you, I was, Clyde, the freshman softball team just won the title. Yeah. <laughs> you take a photo. Barry, you want to do that? That's a no. Kevin, no. DJ, no. Mikhail, no. <laughs> Pinkney, no. Reggie Lewis, no. Bagley, no. Let's get Joe. Joe will do no. it. <laughs> what, uh, what, what, at that time, um, Celtics and the big three were just hanging on, man. Hanging yeah. on. Coming off one at 86. Lost the league is 87, 88. Um, Detroit got him in 88. Detroit, yeah, that's when Detroit sort of grew up. Yep. Yeah. Um, what was, uh, well, I mean, I'm sure you got a million stories, but I guess just being able to spend time, um, with Bird, McHale and those guys, what, 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 what was the time spent in the locker room on the road with those guys? Oh, it was great. I mean, it was, you know, really when I went there, Pat, I felt like that was my first year in the NBA because I was coming from you know, dysfunction. I mean, Sacramento was the, was a dumpster fire. I mean, they, I had four coaches in three and a half years. And I remember one time, I think I counted up my new teammates. I think I played with, you know, 35 different guys in four years. I mean, it was just a, it was a dumpster fire. And, right. uh, and so when I got to, and, and you know how it gets when you're on a bad team, it's every man for himself. You know, <laughs> you know, you're trying to get your numbers so you can get your contract or you're trying to show it ain't my fault. You know, I got, I got 20 and 10. Well, we, you know, we got beat by 40. That's all right. I got my 20 and 10, you know? And so when you got to Boston, it was, you know, none of that was in the picture. It was, you know, we need to win. Yeah. And that, that was, you know, they didn't care who it was, how it happened, you know, they, they wanted to win. That was the, 
the only agenda. And so that was like a breath of fresh air. And just being with those guys, I mean, they accepted you if you worked hard and did your business. And, you know, it, it was just a, a fun, fun culture. And it was a lot of hazing, you know, nothing was sacred. You know, every, right, right. I mean, if you, if you messed up, you know, if you did anything, it didn't matter what it was. If you messed up, you, it, it, there was nothing that was off limits. <laughs> <laughs> they broke down those, those barriers quick. Huh? Yeah, there was no, there was nothing that, that was, Hey, don't talk about this. Or don't you talk about her? Or don't you, if you messed up and, 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 and you did something, they, it was, it was coming. It was coming. You, who was, was Casey Jones, the coach? No, he, he just retired. Jimmy Jimmy Rogers took over. Jimmy for Rogers. Yep. Jimmy Rogers. And Chris was Chris Ford on the was Ford the yeah. 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 Good, uh, good, good guys. Yeah, they were. Did Bird uh, ever invite you down to his cottage in Cape Cod? No, he didn't have a cottage down there. <laughs> that was the room. I was, I was at the I was at the cottage in French Lick <laughs> for the summer. I went down to that cottage. There was no cottage in Cape Cod. I can <laughs> you know how those uh those those urban legends yeah. stop? Everyone's like, well, that's that's his house. We would go down in the summertime, drive by a hundred times, and nah. see if he poke his head out. <laughs> uh, he was at he was at the at the the south shore of French Lake French Lick. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get a chance to go out in Boston or other cities, or was it just it was one of the amazing things people don't realize is you flew commercial. Oh yeah. You flew commercial. Imagine the Boston oh. Celtics walking through yeah. oh, the it airport. Was, it was hilarious. Like we'd be changing planes in Chicago and, you know, Ed Pingy and I, a lot of times would hang back, you know, and chief and all them guys. And I mean, just Larry Bird and them just walking down the going to gate, Gate, going to gate 32, you know, just, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people were losing or, or we'd be in the lounge having a beer because we had a long layover. So we'd all be sitting, you know, people would walk into the bar and it'd be me and Larry and Kevin sit, sitting at the bar and, you know, the double takes and the, right, and, right. Gosh, and or, or we'd all be sitting there at the bar and we'd turn around to leave to go to the gate and, you know, there'd be 60 people, you know, standing right. up, standing behind was, us, you know. Yeah. Was it was it in a, in a sense was it uh, more refreshing because nowadays if that happens you got everybody with their phones taking oh, selfies yeah. ho 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 let me get the, let me get a let me get a, so it was more irritating were the people that came up to you um, just more innocent in a way just just wanted yeah. to chat or well and hell they didn't, beer, maybe. they didn't want to talk to me Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Like, sir, can I, I, was, I was walking by. I was, they were like, "Who's that tall dude?" <laughs> there's Larry. There's Kevin. You know, there's DJ. There's Chief. Uh, Who, who's that dude, man? <laughs> so you go from the Celtics, and now a few more years in the league. Now you end up on Chicago Bulls with Jordan yep. and Eckert, and that's where you win your NBA championship. So at this point, you got a gold medal '84 and the NBA championship in '98. Uh, I, I. Obviously, I grew up watching 80s bat, uh, NBA and then grew into, as older I got, watching 90s. Well, how different was it from a player standpoint? Like those bird teams that you did play on and then fast it, forward 10 years. It was still uh, pretty physical, but it, was, it had started to where, uh, you know, they were trying to take the crazy physicality out of it, which, mm. you know, they, they needed to. I mean, it was it was – it was getting too much. So it was, it was starting to be, but it, it was still just, it wasn't, it was still, it was just, it was similar. I mean, it was still a, when you got to the playoffs, it got very physical and very, uh, they'd let you play. And, you know, early when I got in the league, they, they really started doing away with the hand checking and things mm -hmm. like that. And those things uh, were not as prevalent and, with the Bulls teams and stuff like that, but it was still, I mean, it was still a much, it was still a much different game than it is today. What do you, obviously the championship, but what are you going to remember that team? Like with Celtics, you, you had said you felt like it was a, 
you know, refreshing. It was almost like your rookie season again. Now, what, what was about the Bulls teams that separated them? Well, I mean, you know, Michael, obviously, and right. Scotty, and, and I mean, they're just how great they were on both ends of the floor. I mean, they, they both could get 25 to 30, uh, and they could both take your, your guy that was 25 to 30 and hold him to 10 or 12. So, I mean, every night they could, they could make a 40 point swing Hmm. both ends of the floor with how they could guard and defend. And, and then you, and then Dennis was a great defender too. And so, yeah. and so I think that was the thing that is great is, you know, the numbers that Michael would put up scoring and everything. The thing that was so good about that team is they could lock you up. I mean, right. they could, I mean, you get three dudes that could guard five positions and, hmm. you know, maybe not five because back then the center position was a little different than it is today and, and they right. play more on the block but definitely four I mean you could really switch and do a lot of things and they could made them very versatile defensively with matchups and things like that and um so you look back on and you know we could go you could we could do 30 minutes just on just on each one of those teams that you were on were those was that the goatee days by the way did Dana I, like the goatee no way <laughs> Dana's wanting me to bring the goatee back right now. Oh! All right, honey. <laughs> honey? Yeah, right. No, no answer. No, <laughs> no comment. No comment. <laughs> what, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, I want to talk about a couple more things before I let you go. You mentioned the style. And what is your, when you're watching basketball today, is it is what is it about that may be different of the approach or the style, whatever you want to call it, mm. that irritates you, that grinds your gears, that you say, dang it, I don't like that this came in our game over the last decade or so or two I decades? I, I don't like I don't like it when I see bigs that can't play in the post. I yeah. mean it, it, that are picking and pop and picking and pop. I agree. And it's like, it. it's good if you can shoot it, but you've, right. got, you've got to be able to play in the post. You've got to protect the rim. You've got to rebound. Don't, if, if you, all you want to do is pick and pop, you might as well be 6'2". Yeah. And white and from Everett. <laughs> <laughs> With a big rear end to set a good screen, right? <laughs> but if you're seven feet tall, at some point, play like you're seven feet tall. Right. And, and so I think, I know we're all enamored by the three-point line. But I, I, get, I get, you know, I, I don't like the fact that in a lot of colleges right now, there, there's no teaching, and, and probably in high school too, that, you know, you're not teaching kids how to play, the need to know how to play with their back to the basket. You don't have to be a great at it, but you watch these teams now. I mean, you watch in college, you see it, and I see it, they switch everything. Right. They'll, they'll switch a six ten guy will set a pick and roll, and they'll just switch it, and they can't get the ball to him. And then when they get the ball to him, he's got a six foot two guy on him, and he passes it out for the three instead of taking a guy and trying to go to work. You know, and I mean, it just, it just, it just irritates me. You know, to no end that it's not, again, it's not being taught. I know the game's different, but I just think they're they're missing out on a, a lot of stuff there. They they. <clears throat> It's it's funny that that you say that because I'm I'm always a believer. Yeah, if if every basketball player should be able to shoot past dribble or ball handle, the ball, cool. you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, you don't expect a seven footer to handle like a, like a point but, guard. But if he's if he's got a straight line drive to the basket, he ought to be able to. Right, right. Deck and drive it absolutely. Down to finish. So you coached at Little Rock uh, recently on <laughs> a Division One college level. Um, Little Rock Trojans. What, what, looking back on that experience, what can you take from that? What uh, lessons did, did did you take from doing that? Well, I mean, you know, certainly coaching and playing. I think you really find out how different you are, uh, how different it is, and and yet, I think the first thing you realize is that you got to let players be themselves. You know. I was a very competitive, uh, self-driven, uh, uh, you know, you, 
I was going to, if I lost the game, I was going to, it was going to bother me and I was going to work and, right. you know, and you want everybody to be like you, you know, but yeah. <laughs> that's, that's where you make the mistake is that you can't, you can't talk to everybody the way that, you know, you, you could take it, you know, you could, I could take getting yelled at and cussed at, but that doesn't mean everybody can, you know, right. I mean, and so I think early on, I learned that you have to coach kids, you got to find out, try to find out the main thing you got to find out is what makes them go, you know, what makes them tick, what makes them, you know, find that thing that'll inspire them or get them going. And it's different for everybody, you know, and I think that's the first thing I learned is that it's not one size fits all. I mean, right. and, and you got to, and you got to, and you got to try to reach them, you know, kids or young men nowadays, or back when I coach, you know, we would, when you and I played, coach said, run through the wall, we ran through the wall, <laughs> you know, and kids will still do that. And young men will still do that. But now they, they want to know why, <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> I mean, they'll still do it, but they're, they're going to go, you know, before, okay, coach, before I run through this wall for you, would you explain to me why I'm doing this? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, you got to be able to explain it to them. Yeah. <laughs> why they're doing it to it. So I think that, I think that's what I learned the most is that you know, being, being a, being able to communicate differently and not just again, not think everybody's like you, you know, right, right. You, you were coached this way and you responded to this way. That doesn't mean this guy, this guy, and this guy are the same as you. Yeah. That's, that's interesting how I think even in everyday life, I, I find myself getting caught up in accepting how somebody else reacts to a situation that I wouldn't. And, and, you know, that could beat you down. It could frustrate you. It could, you don't know what, what, where they're coming from. You know, right. I mean, you don't know what how they grew up and what what they experienced and the things they experienced. You may have never experienced. And so, again, that's where I find myself. Like you said, even in in today's society, trying to be. I think it makes you more tolerant mm. and makes you less opinionated. <laughs> to where you know you kind of you listen more than you talk, and I think that's a good thing. Right. Um, <clears throat> Last thing is Coach Eric Musselman. You know him pretty well. You, you know him pretty well. Just, yeah. just, I mean, he's been in the basketball world forever, obviously. And um, I knew you were excited to see him come. He's done some some great things, man. Um, very energetic. From your what what it is about him that you think he was able to? And he's he's hit the ground running, man. I mean, he's right. where they're yeah. at now. Well, he's a basketball lifer, junkie, you know, and so. Yeah. I think that's awesome because he's 24 seven recruiting, which is what you got to do nowadays. I mean, he's getting on kids early, which you have to do at Arkansas. He's doing it in innovative ways with the Twitter and the, and the, and the Instagram and all these things. He's, and, and that, again, that's what kind of what we just talked about is that, you know, kids want that interaction, that different kind of interaction now. And, and he's certainly doing that. I think as a coach, I think it's very refreshing in that I think he does a great job communicating with his players and being upfront with his players. And so that when he has to get on to his players, you know, there's not a lot of pushback because it's addressed in practice, it's addressed in meetings, they know what they're supposed to do. You know, he he shows them, he gives them chances to do it. But then at the end of the day, I mean, he'll, you know, he's not afraid to go, all right, man, you know, it's not your night. You know, right. get right. something else in there, and that's and that's the way, way you have to do it. I mean, you're you're fair, and you and you let people. You know, you want to make sure everybody knows what you want, how you want to do it, what how it's accountable. It's just like Coach Sutton. We're gonna do this is what we're gonna do now. Right. Everybody understand, okay? All right, <laughs> you know, it's like I would tell kids when I was coaching. You know, they would, you know, Coach Shields would be up there talking, and then I would say, now, guys, are you listening to what he's saying? You know, he's talking about you know, defense and rebounding and sharing the ball. So I said, this is what you got to give him if you're right. going to play. You know, it's like I'm, I'm teaching, I'm your teacher, and I'm telling you the quiz tomorrow, Pat's on chapter seven. We're going to go, all the questions are going to come from chapter seven. Do you understand? And you go, nah, I'm going I'm to do chapter six. <laughs> I, 
I like chapter six better, so I'm going to go study chapter six. Well, when I give you the test for chapter seven, you're sitting there going, you know, what the hell? I don't know what's going on. And, and so That's again, when I would look over on Sally's paper. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're dropping your paper, dropping, dropping your pen, <laughs> dropping, the, dropping the pen. <laughs> Oh, I hear you. I hear you. But again, that's what I was like. You know, I think he's a good communicator, which we right. talked about earlier. And I think the guys knows what expected of him. And I think he's fair. I think he, he treats them fair. And so, you know, if you know what's expected of you and everybody's being treated fairly and you can't do it, then that's a you thing. And right. You, you know, and, yeah. and you know, and I, and I, I, I like that. I, I like how he does that. Big Joe, I appreciate it. It's been a little over 30 minutes of hell. Now, everybody get over to Corky's in North Little Rock. <laughs> in, Little, in, both. in Little Rock. In Little Rock. Corky's and, North, in Little Rock. and North Little Rock. And North Little Rock. And get you some good ribs. I'll send you my address after this. You can send me some of those ribs. What's uh? Ribs your grandpa? The, uh, what are you doing? What, what, what are you and the grandbabies doing tonight? Anything? Uh, we're, no, we FaceTime about every night. So they, they're up in uh, Fayetteville. I'm in Little Rock, but you know, we get with them, you know, we just got back from Disney world with them. So oh, nice. that was, that was 15 miles a day walking, Pat. <laughs> yeah, we were, I think you qualify for one of those, uh, yeah. one of the scooters. I don't scooters. think I didn't want one. <laughs> I was sitting there and I'd see the, I'd see him going by and I'd be like, Wow, that look, and they had a little basket on there. You can oh, put yeah. beverages in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's been great. No, but it was, it was they're they're you know, they're five and almost three. And so they're they're into everything. And yeah. the oldest is a he loves any anything with a ball, all sports. He calls me up and tells me all the scores of the games and all that. So it's it's awesome. All right, big Joe, go work on that go team for Dana, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Dana. See you, Big Joe. Thank you, man. All right, man. See Appreciate you, buddy. Thanks a lot, brother. My pleasure, buddy.